we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates, hobby talk like you never seen it. Sports cards live and nothing could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, everybody, welcome to episode number 157 of Sports Cards Live. It is Wednesday night, October the 20th, October the 19th, 2022. My name is Jeremy Lee. I want to thank Connor Walden from buysportscards.com for joining us last time for what was a great episode. You can see that and all other old episodes on the, on the Sports Cards Live YouTube channel. I do want to let everybody know with all the travel that I am doing lately, we will see more shows on special nights, but we do have a show coming this Saturday, this Saturday on Sports Cards Live. Our guests will be Wiley and Alex from the Union Marketplace. So we're doing a bit of a card show series here, card show promoter series with Andre coming on tonight from Montreal. We're going to have Steve Menzi, who organizes and promotes the the Sport Card Expo in Toronto, coming on in a couple of weeks ahead of his show so that is what we are doing right now. Collectible Live, another special time tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, with Collectible CEO Ezra Levine will be joining us for some questions and answers from his community, from the, from the Collectible community, as well as some announcements. And again, I do want to shout out the Union Marketplace for putting on what was an amazing show in Del Mar this past weekend. I also want to shout out the Center Stage app. Download their app in the App Store for quick comps, whether you're pricing cards or shopping at a card show or any platform. It's continuously improving, so please join me in supporting the great team they have and the innovation that they are undertaking. And I want to let everybody know, I do want to shout out Tag Grading, of course. We had a great experience as the Platinum Sponsor at the Del Mar Show, put on by the Union Marketplace. We took on site submissions for the first time. We are planning to do that again in Toronto at the Expo. I want to thank everyone who did come by to learn more about what tag grading is up to, and especially those who submitted cards to us. I want to also let you know that the Toronto Expo, Thursday night of the Toronto Expo, that will be that'll be November the 10th. I will be hosting the traditional Expo dinner at Jack Astor's. If you are watching this or listening to this, you are invited to join. More information to come, but Thursday night, mark in your calendar from 7.30 until we finish up, Jack Astor's is where we'll be all getting together for some dinner and some drinks. I want to shout out the Anti-Expo, the Montreal show, presented by Heritage Auctions. I will be there October 28th to 30th as a vendor. I will have tag slots on display at my booth, along with my personal cards for sale and trade. If you're there, be sure to come by, say hello. I look forward to seeing you, and uh, I'm, I'm excited for this show in Montreal. I want to thank all of you loyal listeners, YouTube viewers, everybody who watches Sports Cards Live, we hit 5,000 subscribers on YouTube earlier this month, so thank you very much. And if you're not yet subscribed, take a moment, please, and do so. Greatly appreciate it. And finally, before we do get to the show tonight, I want to send my, my thoughts and prayers to one of the hobby's best people, Tracy Hackler. Lost his wife yesterday or the day before. I'm not sure exactly when, but I want to just take a moment and uh, you know wish Tracy, let him know he's in my thoughts. I'm sure he's in the whole hobby's thoughts right now and wish him a uh, the most peaceful grieving period possible for him and his and his boys. All right, as always, your comments, your questions are in play. So let's get to tonight's guest. He got his start in the hobby as a kid in Canada, collecting hockey cards and hockey stickers. He took a pause from the age of about 16 to 22 when he, as he said earlier, discovered those things that we tend to discover in our teenage years. Uh, he then came back and he got into autographs. Uh, which has really been his main focus along with cards, but autographs are his specialty. He bought into the, this Montreal show earlier this year. His favorite players are Michael Jordan, Maurice Richard, Jacques Plante, Joe Montana, and Patrick Waugh. And his favorite teams are the Montreal Canadiens, the Chicago Bulls, and the San Francisco 49ers, originally from and currently hailing in Montreal, Quebec, there he is, Andre Lassard. <laughs> Welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing, buddy? I am amazing, and what a presentation. I feel a lot of love coming from my my boy, Jeremy, in Calgary right now. <laughs> well, and, you know, what? I haven't, I haven't done this for a while, but something I used to do in the early days of Sports Cards Live was kind of just mention to everybody, like, how did we know each other? How did me and my guests 
how do we know each other and how do we come how did you come to get on the show so let's just let people know and and maybe you can do the best job of kind of helping me remember like how how long have we known each other what what's the what's the the history of our of our relationship well it's pretty simple i think we're the two pretty boys in the industry and we kind of connected because of that <laughs> <laughs> He said it. He said it, not me, everybody. <laughs> no, Jay, I think we uh, we just, um, you know, hit it off by uh, by talking about cards at some shows in, in, in Edmonton, I think, if I'm not mistaken. That's yeah. where I first met you uh, way back when, when I used to have, uh, I, I had my own memorabilia company for close to 11 years. And um, if I'm not mistaken, it was the Summit uh, show when it, it was ran by Dave Martell. Right. And um, from from that moment, it was kind of my kickstart for the Western uh, Western Canada shows and bringing out talent uh, and autograph guests to to shows out west. And uh, I was doing it already out east. And I think we we hit it off. And knowingly that your wife is from Montreal, well that uh, that helped also. And you know, just a share of me being more of an old soul and liking the vintage cards and stuff like that. And you always having a little eye, uh, a really good eye on those type of cards and uh, bringing in uh, your opinion on what I used to have on the table. So, yeah, I think it goes a long way now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I remember the Summit show in, in its in its original uh, iteration. I think that's yep. probably about 12 years ago now or so. We would yeah, have met and then yeah. seen you at the, at, the, at the Toronto Expo year after year at your own booth with your large display of, of great cards and autographs. And yep. uh, did, did you ever go? Have you ever been to the National? Have we ever run into each other at the National? Yes, 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 yes. But more as a buyer. I've never set up at the National, um, nor have I ever brought any players, uh, especially my concentration and what I do for a living is based on hockey. And, and, and at the National, it's sometimes a little weaker for, for hockey guests, unless if it's in Chicago and it's usually local guys that come up. But um, yeah, we, we've uh, we've seen each other as uh, collectors uh, more than uh, dealers when it comes down to the national yeah and you know so while you say that you know your focus is on hockey and we're going to get into this a little bit later but for for yeah. your show which is coming up here not this yes. weekend but next weekend you've actually got a, a wide variety of autograph guests coming in and when you mentioned them to me i was i was actually really impressed when you kind of <laughs> took me through the story and the themes and i think we'll, we'll right. let you talk we'll let you speak more to that a little bit later but why don't you you know before we get into the card show stuff Take people a little bit through your collecting history and your trajectory. Like I gave a very quick version when I introduced you, but take right. us through your your hobby history from, you know, as far back as you want to go up until now. Right. Well, uh, super quickly, my great grandfather was the founder of the Saguenay of Shikudemi, which was a senior pro uh, team, which was right under the NHL. And he was a founder of that team and still to this day it exists, but in the junior major league in the, in the Quebec uh, junior major league. And I actually, my grandfather drew that logo that they still use. So having that heritage kind of brought down from my great grandfather, grandfather, and my dad, uh, I've always felt really close to the game and especially uh, knowing that, you know, it was all pros and they had really uh, some good NHLers that actually played for, for my family's team back in the day. So my dad used to collect all things that were related to the team that his dad and gran and grandfather owned. So the collectible side in his office always struck me being very interesting so his only set of cards was the 51 52 laval dairy um sagnier shikudemi because that's the year that they won the pro uh trophy as my great-grandfather being the owner and my dad kept those cards when he was a kid because it's 51 52 so that's where I kind of got the feel of the vintage cards and seeing what my dad was collecting and got into hockey and Ironically, my dad was uh, a supplier of the Montreal Canadiens for, do you remember in the 80s, the uh, polo pajamas, the navy blue and uh, baby blue pol polo pajamas that all the hockey players used to wear? Well, my dad was a sales agent for that. It was called Stanfield. And he used to bring me into the forum and meet all the Canadians and go into the dressing room and get sticks and autographs and stickers and cards and get that signed. So it's a combination of all that that really struck my interest in 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 the hobby basically yeah that that's awesome so i want to i want to just call a couple things out first of all 
I, I believe English is your second language. You're obviously fluent in English and French, but I just want to say yeah. that you know you you're obviously a, a French Canadian, but your English is impeccable. First of all, second of all, thank you. Uh, thank uh, you. You've mentioned uh, Saguenay, Chicoutimi a couple times. Uh, these are two different cities in the province of Quebec. For our for our American viewers and listeners, just to clarify, right. those are two different. Yep. Are they two different cities? Are they twin cities? Nope. What is what is Saguenay and what is Chicoutimi? Okay, Chicoutimi is the city, and Saguenay is the name of the team. It's just it's oh. excessively complicated to translate, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> okay. But they they started in the senior professional league, where I'm sure you've heard of the Quebec Aces. Sure. Okay, with Jean Beliveau and Jean Guy Talbot and those guys at uh, that league. Well, that's where my great grandfather started that team to have a team in Chicoutimi. Okay. So Chicoutimi is part of Saguenay region, but Saguenay is the name of the team. Okay. Yeah, it's like saying Canadian and, and Canada. So Canada, okay. Canadian, Saguenay, Saguenay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah, okay. it's a little okay. tongue twister. <laughs> All right. All right. So now you also mentioned the Laval Dairy set, the 5152. And in my mind, the Laval Dairy set contains like almost some pre-rookie cards of, of some important players. The most important being... Jean Beliveau, right? I mean, Jean Beliveau's... Whoop, whoop, whoop. And Jacques Plant. And, okay, thank you. And Jacques Plant. So Jean Beliveau's mainstream rookie card comes from 53 Parkhurst and, mm -hmm. and Jacques Plant's mainstream rookie card, which is a... These are both beautiful cards. Like, if, if you're a hockey collector, you know these cards. You know how important they are. If you're not, mm -hmm. you're probably wondering what we're talking about right now. But trust <laughs> me when I tell everybody listening and watching that the yeah. Jean Beliveau... 53 Parkers and the Jacques Plant 55 Parkers are two of the most important vintage cards in, in the hockey Absolutely. hobby and mm -hmm. two of the most absolute beautiful. But this 51 Laval set is a little, it's a, they're smaller cards, they're black and white, and they're all, they, they kind of contain these pre rookie cards of those two players. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that's exactly it. And don't forget, it was a professional league. It, it was like saying the American League. It was it was a, a team com that, that was based only in Quebec, and there were six teams. Uh, from six cities, but it, it, they were paid. It was a professional league. It was, was super well organized. And even the NHL used to come and dip into the league. And the whole story behind Jean Beliveau not willing to go play for the Montreal Canadiens was that the Montreal Canadiens bought the league to prove a point that Beliveau now had to go to play for the Montreal Canadiens. Because he was so well treat, treated in Quebec City. He was a stud. He was a king. He was number one scorer of the league. They paid him a gazillion dollars a year, even in that era. And he didn't want to go play for Montreal because they had Rocket Richard. They had Boom Boom Jeffrey on. They had all these great players. So he thought he was going to lose his stardom. Got it. Okay. All right. Let's go so, to some comments there you here. Go. <laughs> Thank you for that. We got Studio Sports in the house. Loving that hockey is back, as am I, especially with my Calgary Flames off to a 3-0 and start. Bill Betts in the house. Good evening, Bill, we got hey, Bill. Danny in the house. What's going on, Danny? Good to see you. Hockey cards up is here. What's up? He says, Chad Shipper, good to see you. Yeah, Wednesday, as I mentioned earlier, if you missed it, you know, I'm doing a lot of travel nowadays. And so, Sports Cards Live, although I'd love to do it every Saturday, I mean, I'm going to be at Andre's show in Montreal two Saturdays from now. It's going to be tough to do an episode from there. So, I'm going to try and squeeze them in when I can along the way. So, please be nimble with me, everybody, if you, if you will. I appreciate it. Tyler says, hey, he's buying himself a 51 Laval Dairy card right now. Curious which one, Tyler. Says he loves food and beverage cards. Stick with Sam in the house. What's up, Stick with Sam? Welcome to the show. And Facebook user says, nice looking office or man cave, Andre. Yeah, I like that. Office. <laughs> I, I see a, I, we see a nice uh, old vintage goalie mask right above your finger, right beside that what's probably. Is that a Joe Montana or a Steve Young 49ers helmet? That is a Joe Montana full inscribed helmet and decided is a full replica Jacques Plant mask. Which is one of the original masks, if not the first one. Yes, ever, that is the first one. Yes, we got sir. Mitch. Yeah. We have Mitch Grotman in the house. And I'm sure Mitch is happy that I pronounced his name properly because he went through a, a, he went through a little series of Instagram stories yesterday about how to pronounce his name everybody it's Grotman. <laughs> simple as that it's it's Grotman. Uh, okay happy, happy to help you out mitch so you know before we talk about your new venture so again this this show in montreal it's it's called the the anti expo i don't know what it's called i don't know why it's called that i'm gonna be i'm gonna give you some some tough love here andre i think it's a horrible name yep. but that's it okay is. um yep. 
you know, I'm going to call it the Montreal show. I think that does it a lot more justice and it actually tells people what it is. Uh, Pretty much. Where it is, Montreal yep. card show or card member, whatever you want to do, whatever you're going to do with that. But before we talk about the show, let's talk a bit about um, you also have a career in representing athletes as far as mm -hmm. their autographs. Do you want to talk a bit about that and your, your experience there? Yeah, no problem. So um, long story short, I own a sports memorabilia business for about 12, almost 13 years. Um, closed the company, merged with another company, didn't really work out. And during that uh, one year absence that I took from the industry just to take some time alone, well, a lot of uh, players um, called me up and were asking me opinions and help asking um, for, for, for my professional expertise on, on signings, on appearances and, and, Basically, your, your everyday value on these uh, legends, especially, that didn't necessarily know what their aftermarket is and uh, what type of uh, uh, help that they especially needed. So it came to mind that um, when the player retires, quite frankly, it's, it's a little sad because, and it's normal uh, in a sense that when a player retires, he's in a box for 17 years. And everything that he does is concentrated around performance, training, and results. Anything else is managed through his agencies. And the moment that the player retires, being kind of guided through his whole active career, once he finishes, he doesn't know anything about what he is and or she, specifically on, on Women's National, they don't know their value. They don't know how to negotiate. They don't want to say no. They don't want to unplease people. They it, Guys go back to their hometown to, to, to kind of coach their kids. They get asked to do all these appearances. Um, they have no idea how to negotiate. And quite frankly, the agencies are concentrating on the current kids that they have on their rosters. That and the older guys that have been kind of been taken advantage of all their lives uh, after the career. I'm talking guys that played in the 70s, 80s, early 90s that they are afraid of, of, of being forgotten. Um, so they don't really know how to market themselves. They don't know their value. So that's kind of where the combination came in for me to come up with an idea of offering an agency for retired players and assisting them in all of their their needs, basically. It's simple to say that way. And it's unbelievable how these guys and girls are, are, are so appreciative of having someone stepping in front of them and helping them manage their, their, their likeliness, their image, their, their value. So from, from that moment, well, of course, my expertise is in signings and, and memorabilia because I was in the industry for so long. But even for appearances, charity events, golf appearances, uh, television network, uh, uh, broadcasting, radio, um, anything that you can imagine, I, I step in with my team and, and we assist these players for them not to be taken advantage of and also to give them a structure. So the first thing that I do when I actually sign a player under my banner, we quantify and evaluate every possible income, every source of income. And we quantify those values where I talk with the player and I ask him, what, what's the value? What's the frequency? What type of events do you like, don't like? All those questions for me to now be able to filter those requests for them, having some sort of structure and platform put into place. So I, you can imagine that, that that really came into a snowball effect. And as soon as you start dealing with a few players and you offer that service, it's really it, it's really escalated into something good. And I can't say that um, I'm tapping myself on the back, but I'm very proud to work with alumni and retired players. Well, it's, it sounds like you're providing them a great service and it sounds like you're providing them a customized service. Well, everyone's going to be different. So I think that's yeah. probably going to give you a leg up on perhaps some competition. It's a, it's important to be sensitive to their needs. So uh, yeah, good on yeah. you for that. Let's talk about the card Thanks. show now. So first yeah. of all, I don't even know how to say it. Is it is it the anti expo? Is it lanti expo? How do you how do you say the show? Okay, well, French is lanti expo, so it is anti expo, meaning it's a uh, it's a demeanor on on an expo. It's saying that we do we do everything on the contrary of what a typical expo does. I see. The backstory was that there was another huge show in Montreal many years ago. Um, 
and there was a bit of a, a conflict of interest between both promoters. So they decided one was called the Montreal Expo, so they decided to call it the Anti Expo. I see. Okay. And you know what? It's interesting because right now, and we're going to talk about this a bit later, but right now we are seeing and you know we're hearing about it from people who are <clears throat> who are in in bigger centers that have two or three card shows going on on any given day in their in their own backyard and they can't decide where to go and they feel like like the promoters aren't working together so they're just diluting the marketplace and is that good or bad for the hobby i think there's mm -hmm. a lot of that going on and let's it's kind of funny it, it's not like that's a new phenomenon you just proved it right now this is something that's been going on going back 12 or so year i saw on the website today again the website for this show everybody's on the ticker right now it's it's antiexpo.com and i think it said like you, the show coming up uh in, in about 10 days is the 12th edition of it so if it's once a year this has been going on we've had card show battles for at least 12 years uh and this is just in you know in, in montreal canada so you yeah. know we're seeing it now elsewhere but it, it's nothing really new so um, right. Okay. Before we go on, I see we have Jim in the house, and uh, Jim Francis is a long, a long time. Oh. He's a he's a stalwart <laughs> of the hobby. Let's see what he has to say. He says the I was Anti talking to him last night. So <laughs> he, he says Anti Expo is a terrible name, but the original founders did a great job building a solid show, and Andre will only help improve it. Well, there's a nice, uh, nice encouragement from Jim. And Jim, thank you. Wow. That's rare. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm <laughs> always, kidding. <laughs> always good to see. Uh, good to I see love you, Jim. Um, yes. So how did you, so Andre? Let's let's talk yeah. about this then. Um, how did you actually get involved? Like you you reached out to me a I don't know a couple months ago. I said, Jay, guess right. what? You're right, and you yeah. told me. So how did you actually get involved with this particular show? Before you answer, very quickly, stick with Sam. Says the key for shows that are happening the same day should be far apart from each other exactly that's the key that's like east coast west coast right, right? yes right please <laughs> okay okay tell so, us Andre, yes okay how did you get involved with the anti-expo okay um i've always had an interest in purchasing shows which by the way i did purchase a show in edmonton uh, a few years ago and uh resold it because of my transition in, in my industries and um uh, I also uh, was very interested in the other Montreal show that Anti Expo decided to go against. And we had made many, many, uh, many offers and we never came to an agreement. So that show promoter instinct in me has always been there. Um, and when I joined the team at Anti Expo to start bringing in talent at the time, I really felt a huge dynamic and a wind of change. And I really liked the positivity of the three, four founders of, of, of the anti expo, uh, uh, 15 shows ago, basically. So almost, um, what is that? Seven, eight years ago, as a matter of fact. So I've always said, if ever one of you guys decides to sell one of your shares, or if you guys want to take me on board as a fourth partner, I'm there. Sure enough, that's what happened. Um, two of the three original owners decided that they needed to concentrate on their business. And um, I basically bought one of uh, the two original shareholders. From there, I just want to be very clear. I only had two conditions. My first condition was, if you guys want me on board, condition number one, we're changing the name. <laughs> so, so good. and condition number two we're changing the venue which we'll get back uh, on a couple of minutes uh, a little later on that so i said for the financials and you're gonna laugh i'm maybe the worst businessman on planet earth i told one of the, the original owners about those two conditions i said for the rest you negotiate in my name tell me how much it costs and i'm in if you respect the two conditions the rest i don't care so from there, it was pretty simple because, A, I'm one of the only ones that can actually communicate in English. B, one of my strengths is corporate um, business uh, organization, uh, uh, marketing, evidently, and autograph guest and autograph pavilion. So as you can imagine, those four points are now my responsibility. So it doesn't mean that I'm not taking in people that want to set up at the show or talking with clients and stuff like that. But my real responsibility are the four that I just mentioned. Okay, I got it. It's funny. I received a, a message on <coughs> my Sorry. Instagram. I think it was Instagram, that or Facebook, like yesterday or the day before. Someone wrote to me and they said, 
I really liked the Anti Expo until they moved to the current venue. Yeah. And I had already known that because you would you would give me a bit of a sneak peek that you were going to switch the venue up, but not for this show ten days right. from now that I'm coming to. But you're going right. to be mixing. You're going to be changing the venue for your the next show. And I think that's important for people who are oh, yeah. watching and listening right now who are in the area or planning to come or just don't. Because obviously your second condition was change the venue. I mean, I don't know what I'm in for. I don't know what I'm going to walk into. And they, from now, <laughs> no, you know, it's not that bad. It's just because they were used to the old venue. What happened was the old venue under uh, underwent uh, renovations. Last minute, they pulled the contract away from the previous owners and said, we can't host a show anymore here because we're renovating. So they had to turn around and find a venue. Then the pandemic happened. So <clears throat> after pandemic... All the great venues that were available are all booked because of people, weddings and this and that and call it the way you want. So nothing was available for this show. And quite frankly, by the time that we got all the paperwork done and all the, the, the contract on, on my shares being approved and whatnot, it was, it was a little too far into the, the season early fall uh, to be able to shop for a new venue. So people, if you're listening and you're coming, it's a bridge show. The content is amazing. Maybe the context isn't that great, but honestly, it's, it's fine because we've never had so many corporate sponsors. My number one mission was to get the show sponsored, and sure enough, I'm very proud to say that Heritage Auction is sponsoring our show. They will be there. They're there in person coming all the way from Texas. They're bringing a lot of surprises there, and just starting with the largest auction house in the world means that they know where and how our direction is heading. Yeah, that says a lot. That's a good, uh, definitely, definitely a good endorsement from, from Heritage to come up for sure. Uh, and Jay, Skeppy, wants, Skeppy wants to know, uh, what non-traditional marketing have you found to be effective for card shows? I think it's a good question because you, you know, you did mention that you're, you're kind of, coming in with some i liked how you said it before you know marketing yeah so 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 it goes marketing is one of my skills and i wonder like is there non-traditional marketing or or is it mo like is is this non-traditional marketing i'm having you on you're a friend of mine we've known each other for a long time i'm coming yeah. to the show i want to make sure as many people come to this show as possible because i'm right. going to be there set up as a vendor i'm going to have cards for sale and trade so i'm marketing yep. this for for you, I'm marketing this for me. I'm marketing this for the hobby, for the Montreal region, mm -hmm. the Quebec region. All these things. Yeah. I think it's a good. I think it's a good positive thing. But to Skeppy's question, are have you done any non-traditional marketing, or or just speak to that if you can? Yeah, you know what? The first line of business that I decided that I wanted to implement every show. As of this show, we're giving away a free booth to a collector to come and show off his man cave. Cool. So right there, we have someone called Habs Cave. He has something like 25,000 followers. Hab Cave has the biggest Montreal collection, I've, a Canadian collection I've ever seen in my life. Game used, autograph cards, you name it. Sunil is his name. And Sunil um, is our first choice, was our first choice. And I told him about the concept of every show as of today, we are giving away a free booth on, on us to have someone come in, not to sell and trade, to show off their man cave. And when we talk about man cave, we're talking about high collectibles, originality, concepts, themes, call it the way you want. Well, that's showing that we respect our clients that are attending the show by giving them an opportunity to show off what they love the most. And that's their own hobby and their own collectibles. So yeah, right awesome. there, thank you. That see, see, that's how we are remarketing. Maybe not reinventing, but remarketing is to go and and take your attendees at your show by the hand and showing them that they're worth showing off what they collect. Right on. Okay, no, that that's really good. My, I had a question which was like, what experience do you have promoting shows? And I don't know that that's really a fair question. I don't know that you no. you need a ton of experience promoting shows because you have right. partners that have experience. You've been right. in the show scene for so long. You have all the right. contacts. I just know that of you myself. That's not even really an yeah. assumption. I just know that to be the case, knowing yeah. you for for several years now. 
Um, right. So I think that's a great thing. And what I like about that particular idea of, of having a collector coming to show off their man cave with a free booth at the show is that at, at, that'll attract a lot of attention. Uh, 10 days. That's okay. That'll attract right. a lot of attention 10 days from now. But yeah. what'll also happen is people at the show will then be able to say, Hey, maybe I can be the guy next time to do this. So that's I think, it. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's exactly. a great idea. Uh, very quick, let's say hello to Rage, who's back in the house. What's up, Rage? Good to see you. Good to see you back in the building. Rage is in the building once again. So let's talk a bit about your ideas to kind of update and breathe new life into this show outside of changing the name, outside right. of changing the venue, uh, what you right. just mentioned, um, uh -huh. you know, breathing new life. Is it going to, is this, is the schedule going to change or be updated? How many times a year is it going to be? And then we'll talk about autograph guests because I do really like what you've done with that. Okay, great, thanks. Well, yeah, um, as a matter of fact, one of the main things that Montreal was a little weaker on is getting um, a lot of the uh, East Coast corporate sponsors to come in, like PSA Canada that were never there, KSA that were ne never there. We, we're bringing in people that, for some reason, East Coast is only associated to Toronto at the Expo, and Steve Menzi, by the way, is a dear friend of mine, so I'm not saying anything negative. On the contrary, is to say that there's another market on the East Coast also that we can hit uh, from the Maritimes, Northern US, and our friends from Ontario, where our show is going to be twice a year as well. And we are going to open it up to three days. So that being said, don't forget another thing, the French Canadian collectors, that's a huge market also that sometimes they don't feel comfortable going to Toronto or in an Anglophone market because maybe some dealers, some of the promoters, some of the people, the staff don't speak French. And I'm not saying all French Canadians don't understand or speak English, but I'm just saying that for them, we feel that they, they deserve a nice show with some nice corporate and some nice diversity, kind of like on a, a smaller scale of what Toronto are doing, but at a, at a scale that's worthy for the East Coast, Maritimes, Quebec, and Northern U.S. Yeah, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's it's really you're sen being sensitive to the issue, sensitive to the region. Somebody, I forget who, it might have been my wife. I forget who it was, but I when I mentioned that I was going to this show, no, it couldn't have been my wife, but someone said to me, um, so how do you think the show is going to be for you? And I said, well, listen, I mean, I've been setting up at the Toronto Expo for 17 years now, twice a year, right. missed maybe one or two. Um, but yeah. this is going to be a different experience because I, number one, when I even set up as a vendor at a card show, I love getting away from my booth and walking around and doing some shopping myself. There's nothing like right. looking at, at new inventory. I'm excited because I know I'm going to see inventory and dealers I've never seen or met before. Exactly. And on the flip side, they're going to see my inventory that they've never seen before. So now I have, you know, I move through my inventory pretty quick in, in most cases. So it's not like, right. like the Toronto people will be seeing old inventory. But my point is, is that, and actually seeing as your show is before the Toronto Expo, uh, the Montreal, the Montreal collectors are going to get sort of first dibs at what I'm bringing ahead of the Toronto, uh, the <laughs> the, Toronto there you go. And, and vendors, right? So that yeah, that was a whole that was the whole principle and the, the thought behind it was knowing that we're 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 hosting you and sure. that we're getting first crack at your stuff. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. No, I'm very uh, I'm very excited to uh, to come out to that and. Uh, and, and just be there. And plus, you know, I've got family there. Again, as you said, my wife's from Montreal. So I come out, I get to kind of kill a couple birds with one stone and, uh, yep. and accomplish a few things. But I'm excited for to be there at the show. I'm excited for you, Andre. I'm excited to see what, what, what you. you're going to bring to the show as we Thank as you. it moves forward. Uh, let's go to a couple comments that have come in as well. Rage says, as a dealer myself, shows locally with 100 tables and under seem to be very well alive. Just have to have the right stuff. If you only have all modern stuff, ninety percent of the room, ha you has you're doomed. I think. I think. Yeah. I think he's just saying if if all you have is is ninety stuff, yeah, there's not a lot of movement there. Uh, let's see here. Um, Grant Patterson says, Andre, who was behind the short two day rebooking idea? I've attended the show for two years, but was thrown off when you guys said if the contract wasn't signed and paid for in two days, we lose our spot. Uh, is that something that you can respond to, uh, to Grant? Grant, that was the past. Let's look at today and move forward. There's, uh, there's, uh, one of my four, four missions of the business is to restructure it. And, uh, trust me with my knowledge and where I've been and the shows that I've done all over the U S and Canada, that experience also comes into factor where we're going to be at. 
uh, handling our dealers uh, a little better. That there you go. I think that that's good to hear. And I think that I think that show promoters, and it seems like you understand this, Andre. Uh, and I know Grant, and and I, I like Grant a lot. Grant's a good Grant's a good hobby buddy of mine. Um, I like I I think it's important for show promoters to really cater to the vendors. I'm not saying that they don't in other cases, but I, I have to shout out the Union Marketplace, which is the 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 organization behind the show in Del Mar, San Diego that I just came from last week. And right. uh, these guys, and again, the two guys behind the Union Marketplace will be our guests on Saturday on Sports Cards Live. And uh, they did a great job of hosting and catering to their vendors. And uh, and I think from what I'm what I'm feeling from you, Andre, is that you're kind of taking that same position that you know because a show is nothing without happy and solid vendors. I Correct. think that uh, I think I think you understand that. Am I am I fair? Oh, is yeah. that fair to say? It's it's our core. It's our structure. That it's because of our vendors that we have a show. So we, we have to treat those vendors the way that we want to be treated, and then consequently, those vendors and dealers are going to treat the clients that come through our door with respect because we're respecting our dealers. So it's it's up to food chain, and we have to respect that. Um, so it's not just getting corporate dollars and sponsorship that's that's honestly that's the easy part because it sells when you come down to the basics it's your dealer it's your dealer that's spending money to come and taking their gamble and the risk and you know purchasing and 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 showcases and hotels and restaurants and all that they're 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 our base those are the people that we need to treat the best and from them they're going to vehicle the proper reputation of the show. Yeah. You know, yeah, honestly, yeah. there's one, one, I'm not going to say who, but there is one uh, show promoter that I know very well. He's a dealer in other shows. Um, you do not see this person buying or selling one card. He is at the front when it's set up time for the dealers, greeting every dealer. When the show opens, he's in front greeting every client, every attendee. And for me, that's respect for your show. So yeah. that's exactly where I'm heading. And I, I want to reassure people that it's there's no language barrier. Don't be afraid because it's Montreal. By the way, Montreal is 70% Anglophone and 30% Francophone. So stop okay. thinking that Montreal is all Francophones. <laughs> all right. Good. Okay. And we've got some commentary on that. Let's go through some more stuff here. Rage, uh, sorry, not. I want to. Sorry, Rage. We're gonna go. Sorry, here with JG says, Is it true that the majority of hockey collectors don't care if the card is graded, unlike most other sports, or they need to have a PSA 10? I mean, I, I can speak to that and tell you, I, uh, I mean, a lot of the hockey collectors I know do like their cards graded, and uh, so may, maybe that maybe the guys who are you know, and I listen, there's no general rule here, it's going to be all over the board in all sports, not just. Not just yeah. hockey. I think even saying where the where this comment says most other sports collectors where they need to have a PSA ten, uh, that's not the truth either. That's just a generalization. But yeah. I think that uh, I don't know that hockey's that much different than other sports. I you see tons of graded cards, and uh, as far as you know, what I was going to say before is that a lot of people who just put together the set of of tops or Parkhurst or Opeachy every year, yeah, they want them in their binders. A lot of people, and I think that goes for. We see people filling those into the national for their baseball, football, and basketball sets every year as well. So I, I think it's just kind of a situational thing. And there's no general rule. But keep it on moving. Stick with Sam says, from my experience of hosting the Brampton Card Show, which is a, a city in Ontario, says, I found social media really helped market it. And I think that I think that goes without saying, right? I mean, yeah, social media, is, especially since you have such a, such a, a targeted and focused audience, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Rage says, spot on, Jeremy. Never mind the options you have being behind the table from walk-ups. That's the true treasure. Again, talking about being behind the behind having a booth at a card show gives you kind of dibs on what comes in the show for sure. And I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing some cards come in the door, uh, being offered for sale or trade to me uh right. two weekends from now at the Montreal show. Uh, Mitch says, How difficult would it be as someone that knows zero French? That's me as well, Mitch. By the way, I know I know bonjour. 
and uh, Boulet Vu Couché. <laughs> That's about all I know. Uh, the two most uh, important ones. <laughs> which is, which uh, Boulet Vu Couché avec moi ce soir, which I believe means uh, will you sleep with me tonight or something like that. I remember that from. I from won't. You. I'm married. I'm sorry, Jeremy. That's okay. <laughs> I wasn't asking you. But that's oh, all okay. I know. But anyway, Mitch wants to know, you know, how not knowing any French, uh, how hard will it be to have a good show experience at the expo as someone that's never been to Montreal? Um, okay. Two things before you speak to that, Andre, I will say that Mitch, number one, um, I'll be able to let you know the you know the day after the show because I'm like you. I've been to Montreal, but I've I've I, sh- I can't I can't say I've never been to a card show there. There was one time about four or five years ago, I happened to be in Montreal. And found out there was that Ruby Foos show, and I went in mm-hmm. for about an hour. Uh, but for all, in- effectively speaking, I've really never been to a Montreal show and taken in the whole weekend experience. So to Mitch and anyone else, if you're not coming to the show two weekends from now, I can I will definitely let everybody know after what my experience was like. But let's turn it over to you, Andre, to speak more directly because right. you know the you know the market much better than I do. Right. Uh, quite frankly, um, half of our dealers are non-Quebec dealers, first of all. Um, secondly, out of the other 50% that are actual local dealers, I'd say 30% to, to 40% set up at the Toronto show, so they're perfectly bilingual. And the rest, I'd say that they're very fluent in English. You may have two dealers out of 100 plus that are, are going to be a little more uncomfortable talking in English. But what's great about it is with the number of people, you can wave someone down and have someone to translate for those two or three dealers that don't speak English. So I, I'm not, I'm being very, um, uh, conservative. Uh, yeah, conservative by saying there's no language barrier. Please, please stop having that idea of French is only Quebec and we don't speak English, please. Yeah, my, <laughs> my experience being in Montreal, again, my wife's from there, so I do spend a bit of time there, is that, Whenever I go into a business and they say they say um, bonjour, I don't I don't know if anybody, which is French for hello. I always say hi, and they switch to English right away, and they have no right away, no pro, right away. They switch to English, so yep. uh, they yep. they kind of assume you speak French, but as soon as they realize you don't, they're very uh, they're, they're very accommodating for for the the English speaking. Uh, Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Hotel or restaurants. Wanna, mm-hmm. right, yeah. The other thing I want to mention is that if if I'm going to be and I'm going to be there, if I'm going to be talking to a vendor who doesn't speak English and I don't speak French, I feel like even without a translator, we speak the language of, of cardboard and we know yep. what our money looks like. We can easily just say, you know, fit, like even if you don't speak, speak English, you kind of know what 50 means or 60 or 100. I mean, these are right. right? These are yep. these are things that almost even a, a, a francophone knows what they mean. So I don't think there's yep. going to be much of an issue. But I think Andre makes a great point. Flag someone down or grab someone you know or, you know, find someone to help you uh, kind of make right. that connection so you can get a deal done. Right. Exactly. All right. Rage, Rage says I need to expand and I need to attend an expo soon. Definitely on my bucket list. And Jim, who uh, who I know is an Anglophone, says I don't speak French. From my experience, language is not an issue at the Montreal show. I have maybe one to two people a show that only speak French and we still manage to figure it out. Right. That's what I was just saying. You figure it out because... Yeah. We talk the same language of cardboard and and numbers are kind of a lot easier to communicate in than where you can 80, 80 dollars, you know, or eight yeah. or whatever, eight hundred, eight thousand, right? Yeah, eight, exactly. Zero, zero, zero. <laughs> you can do those, you can yeah. do those sorts of things, right? So, so and then the last yeah. comment I want to go to, and uh this is someone on Facebook. And if you're on Facebook and your name is coming up like this, if you go to streamyard.com slash Facebook and just hit the blue button. Uh, that will allow me to see your name. How is your Louis Domingue PC coming along, Andre? So just for anyone who doesn't know, Louis Domingue is an is was an NHL goalie. He had a couple of good streaks, but he's really not not much of a not much of a uh, hobby. Let's just say he doesn't get any hobby love except from Andre. So Andre, <laughs> no, I, had from Andre. <laughs> We all make a mistake at one point in our collecting careers. Well, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it's when we really collect what we like that we can make a mistake. But I, I kid, of course. I always yeah. do that role. Collect what you like. I, but, I, but make I'd sure love to know who that is. It's like collect what you like, but make sure what you like isn't 
something that might just become completely worthless down the road and unless you're a, a relative yeah. or something like that right yeah i guess my crystal ball and that one uh kind of shattered on me <laughs> very blurry very blurry crystal ball uh jim jumps in again and says jeremy i've only come across two dealers that don't speak english and they don't have anything you'd like so that's good news for me i don't need to i don't need to worry about that then so thanks for the heads up on that jim so I want to I want to ask you this before we kind of get into more general show talk, Andre. As far as yep. the anti expo goes, which I I'm calling the Montreal show, and I'm curious to see what you guys rename it. I hope you right. go something a bit more generic and 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 uh, you know something that is understandable by the greater world versus uh, just just French speaking people. But that's I know I know for the I know uh, Quebecers being the province of Montreal is in and uh, French people are very proud. It's a very proud uh, people and, and, mm -hmm. and rightfully so the heritage, the history, the beauty of the province. I mean, Quebec, old Quebec, it's all, it's a wonderful place. Um, but what are your goals for the show now that you're involved, you've got partners and you're probably bringing the, you're the fresh voice. You're the new ideas coming in. What goals do you have for your, for your Montreal show going out, three, four, five years. Right. Um, quite frankly, I, I, I kind of surfaced a little earlier just by saying that, you know, uh, there's there's four big shows in Canada, let's face it. Montreal for a very long time was second in, in ranking. No disrespect against the others, but um, it, lost, it lost a bit of edge over the years. Um, and I remember like 15, 20 years ago, Montreal, when it used to be at the, the, the Olympic Stadium, we used to have four or 500 dealers and corporate and, and, and autograph pavilion and pretty much what we're seeing in Toronto. Um, it still has its niche because of the history of our sports and, and, and legends and, and hockey and sports greats. If you look at Jackie Robinson or Gary Carter, or I'm not just talking about hockey. Evidently we know the history behind it, but we want to bring it back to a place in the hobby that we deserve. Um, especially with, more um, American and Canadian Anglophone dealers, as well as uh, partners that can really support where we're heading um, and just make it one of the best shows again uh, in Canada where people talk about it. Because again, um, you know, if, if you're coming in with your better half and they're not interested in the hobby, Montreal is such a great place to go for, for art museums or, or wine cellars or restaurants. I mean, we're okay. world renowned for that, right? Yeah. So yeah, sure. it's, it's, we want to make Montreal a happening event where everyone can actually have a great weekend out of it. I mean, Montreal is a world class city. It's a city that is mentioned among yeah. other major metropolitans across around the world. So, I mean, it's not like you got to really pump up the city of Montreal too much as far as tourism goes. It's probably one of the most beautiful cities in all of Canada, you know, yeah. outside of the interior BC, which is a complete different thing altogether. But Montreal, right. the history, Montreal also has the Montreal Canadiens, which is the hockey team, which is an original six team. Some of the loyalist fans of any professional franchise in the world are mm -hmm. Montreal Canadiens fans. We, call, we, we refer to the Montreal Canadiens, the hockey team, as the Habs, which is right. short for the the hab habitant i believe is that right yep, that's exactly right yep the french original canadian hab original yep original canadian something like that so we call them the yep. habs i mean that's what i call them i just call them the habs i don't call them the canadians but yep. it's it's a it's a city and a market that is deep roots in its history love for its for its montreal canadians and there were the montreal expos there for several several years as well and unfortunately right. for montreal they moved to washington but there's still a lot of collectors. You still see people wearing Montreal Expos baseball hats All across over. the whole country of Canada. You even see them in the U.S. I've seen them in the U.S. sometimes. Let's talk about the autograph guests that you have coming to the show because you did mention to me yep. that you've got some different themes. So let's run right. through. Let's start with baseball because we're talking yep. about it right now. And I was yep. actually, one of the reasons why I was impressed, Andre, was because you know the the autograph guests that you're bringing in are not just hockey. You're bringing in some baseball players too. So. For right. our south of the border viewers and listeners, um, and of right. course, there's going to be a Montreal tie-in here, I believe. But who's come? What autograph guests do you have that that were baseball players? 
Yeah, well, uh, I'd like to thank Expo Fest, which is a charity here in Montreal that they do an annual gala dinner and they bring all sorts of uh, uh, Expo alumni and retire greats and they do this big uh, charity dinner. And twice a year at our shows, we, we actually let them have a, a booth set up where they bring in some some Expo, some uh, of those guests that they that sometimes go to their dinner. So this year, um, we actually have the line of the shields that's coming in. Uh, Al Oliver and Dave Cash. So if you know your baseball a little, the line of the Shields is a stud. And for him to come up to Montreal and, you know, revisit his old uh, city and, and where he had a, a good portion of his career um, on a high, we can't complain about having the Shields. Al Oliver was, was a major, major player in the 70s. And Dave Cash was, I mean, th that's that for us in Montreal is is bigger than any MLB non-expo. I'm telling right. you, it's huge. It's huge, huge, huge. So I'm yeah. really happy about that concept for the Expo Fest. Um, we always try to go with themes. Sorry, go ahead. Jump. I just want to jump in for one second. I remember yeah, yeah, very clearly, I remember very clearly, 1990, Leaf comes out. Leaf Baseball comes out after being absent from the hobby for like 40 years or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> and it came out to, to really to compete with the first set of Upper Deck that came out with, of course, Ken Griffey Jr.'s rookie card. I remember opening up, I remember being in, in Winnipeg at the at the Forks, which is like a tourist area. There was a guy who had a card shop there. His name was Rick. And uh, I remember opening up packs of Leaf baseball there, hunting for the Frank Thomas rookie card, hunting for yep. the set, what was the second year Ken Griffey Jr., but the Delano De Shields rookie card was in that set as well. I, I, think, <laughs> yeah. I, I believe that to be the case. Like if, if not, then I, my memory is is uh, isn't serving me well. But I remember very clearly searching and hunting for the Delano De Shields rookie card, the John yeah. Olerud, and more. But um, but that's really cool, man. Delano, that is a big name. So uh, sorry, I interrupted you. What was the the next no sort of problem. theme? That, what was the next sort of theme that you have coming through? Well, you know, by by bringing in players to shows for so many years uh, we kind of understood that themes really work um so uh, themes and concepts so you know of course montreal we're talking about the 93 stanley cup which is the last uh, canadian stanley cup to be hoisted and uh, we have some guests that that have never signed in montreal um even guys that were almost thank god uh, almost passed away a year and a half ago um, like lyle odeline that's coming in from Pittsburgh just for the show. We have JJ Daniel that's coming in from Arizona, uh, Kevin Holler that's coming in from Calgary, and Gilbert Dion that's coming in from Sudbury. Those four guys that won the cup in 93, while well, three of those four have never signed autographs in Montreal. So people that have projects, jerseys, team photos of the 93 cup don't have those four autographs. So again, a theme. It doesn't, you know, sometimes you don't need that big, big, big guest to draw you it, sometimes concepts shadow off that big big guest and in this case i felt that you know going with the 93 cup with rare players it was a good way to kind of kick start this new uh this new direction um of course we can't forget our nhl stars we have ally afraidy that's coming in why did we bring ally afraidy when he broke the record in 1993 at the all-star game for the hardest shot where was it I was there. I was at that All-Star game in Montreal. Me too. And guess what? I was sitting right where the doors open, where the visiting dressing room, all the players were literally walking to my left. And Al Iafredi, after he broke that record, showed the stick to the stands and had that rubber mark that was left on the stick. From and he puck. walked out of the ice. Yeah. He walked off the ice. I tapped him on the shoulder. He said, can I have your stick? He goes, no way, kid. <laughs> <laughs> so I am Frady is, is an icon nice in Montreal, even if he never played for the Habs. <laughs> you you, you got to You got to bust his balls about that uh, next oh, week. Of course. When, when, when of course I will. You, you yeah. know me. I will. Uh, Alex, we also Alex, have. Alex, uh, I got to make yeah, a comment sorry. about Ally Afraidy. He Ally Afraidy, if, if anyone out there doesn't know him, he has the hairstyle that's that's known as the oh. skullet. The sc oh. not a mullet, but a skullet. Basically, imagine being bald like me, but having hair, you know, coming down long, right? Long there with a bald top. That's that's the skullet. And Ally Brady, to... he, he wore it very well, let's face it. But you weren't gonna mess with Ally. He was known for having the hardest shot oh. in the NHL for, for several years. Like 
over 100 miles an hour kind of shot. And he's a big boy. He is a big boy. So coming into the big boys, uh, Montreal uh, favorite uh, record for penalty minutes. Chris Nyland is going to also be there. Um, always, always in every show that I can book players or now that I'm responsible for bringing in players, I'm a women's national advocate. So we have Kim St. Pierre. That's a hockey hall of famer. First woman national goalie ever to be inducted as well as Mila Didau, a two-time gold medalist. And we have this rising star called, called Joshua Waugh. Last year, he had 119 points uh, with Sherbrooke in, in the Q, Quebec Junior Major League. And he just signed a contract with the Montreal Canadiens, up and coming star. So, all undrafted? in all, we have 12 guests. Is Jonathan Waugh undrafted? No, he was undrafted and actually signed with Montreal. And He's had back-to-back amazing years. He was even called up last year, um, played a couple of games with the uh, Laval Rocket, which is the American Hockey League team that's associated with the Habs. So, like I said, we have 12 guests on a two-day show. I think that's pretty goddamn good. Yeah, that is pretty good. So I, I said earlier, I think the 28th to the 30th, which implied a three-day show. It's really it's a, it's a two-day show, Saturday and Sunday, the 29th and 30th, right? Correct, correct. 28th, it's just it's dealer night. We're setting up. Uh, we have a nice little surprise for the dealers on Friday night. We want them to hang out. It's just, again, we want to create an event out of it because it is an event. So our dealers, we just don't want them to set up and go back to their hotel. Stick around, trade, buy, sell amongst dealers. A few surprises waiting for you guys when you come. And we're going to have a good time on Friday night. Awesome. Okay, a couple comments now. <coughs> Sorry. Stick with Sam says, I'm helping to promote the St. Catherine's card show this Sunday. For future reference, any suggestions on how I can attract Americans near the border to travel to the show? It's a great question. Any any advice, uh, Andre, you want to give? Because I guess uh, I don't know where St. Catherine's is on the map exactly, but is it close to the U.S. border? You know what? The best marketing? Tell them that the, the exchange rate's at 1.45 right now. <laughs> yeah that's is it that is it is, is our dollar that bad right now yeah so you can yeah. tell them that they're getting half off on everything on the dealer's tables yeah that you know what you're right that is the biggest that that right there sam and anyone else uh, anyone in, in in the states who wants to come up to canada for a show you're basically getting like a 40 percent discount 30 to 40 yeah. percent discount yeah. so that's nice. that's unbelievable yeah. Unbelievable. I, I, I had actually marketed it that way. I know it sounds cheeky, but it really is. And and quite frankly, we have a lot of U.S. customers coming up just because of that. Yeah, yeah. Rage says the Bowman Delino de Shields was his rookie, him and Marquise Grissom. I remember that as well. LGC Opeachy oh, yeah. says that, yeah, the Shields, Grissom, and uh, Larry Walker, the Hall of Famer from the Colorado oh, yeah. Rockies, where he was oh, inducted, yeah. uh, 1990 Expo Outfielders. Skeppy says, wasn't Ally afraid up against Ray Bork in that all-star game? Quite likely. Quite likely he yeah, was. Yeah, 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 Hockey yeah, part yeah. up. Josh Waugh has 17 points so far in just seven games in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. So I haven't even heard of him until right now. Really? So that's exciting. Oh. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's collect- an outcome newcomer. Collection SML says he was drafted in the fifth round, so there's a bit of a bit of news for for both of us. Oh, very good. Sorry. Rage says that Ally Afraidy rocked the skullet like a savage and took names as well. Yes, he yes he would have for sure. And yeah, Sam, that should work. Uh, Americans get quite the nice deal. That which speaks right to Mitch, who lives in Chicago. Says the exchange rate was a huge push to get me to drive to the Toronto Expo next month. Yeah, no doubt about it for sure. So. Good stuff right there. So, all right. Um, I have a question on my notes, but I think we talked about, you know, it was basically what can attendees expect to see at the Anti-Expo that's different from other shows. But I I think we've kind of covered that already with the autograph guests. And really, new inventory is is the big one. Definitely. So let me ask you this. Let's get all. Okay. I think we've talked about your show ad nauseum at this point i think we got everything out of you that we can i want to get your opinion on card shows in general and really you know we have so much at our fingertips this little device here you know which which may or may not come with a sports cards live sticker on the back um we have access to so many cards on here platforms marketplaces social media everything everything you could want auction houses it's all on here 
Um, right. But there's, I believe there's something special about the card show. So I want to ask you, with me kind of loading it up for you, but how do you see card shows fitting into the hobby landscape as we move forward, keeping in mind that some people think there's too many card shows. Some people say that, that card shows, while they are awesome for transacting, we don't get any comps out of them. You don't know what cards are selling for, which hurts the general market because you don't have that information, those data points. I kind of, I understand the, the argument, but it's like, I don't, I don't care. Like, like, right. Well, like more. It, it, yep. So with all that, I'll, let's turn it over to you. How do you see card shows fitting in into the overall hobby landscape right now? While there is a contingent of people saying there's too many of them. Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. If there's too many of them, it means that the, the hobby is, in, is very healthy. That means it, there's a market, there's a business to be made out of it. So if there's too many at one point, uh, is it because the hobby is so strong? Is it uh, because people um, don't have anything else to, to do? I, I, I can't answer that. But I can answer one thing is that you and I have been in this since we've been almost in diapers. There's no better feeling going into a show and getting the vibe, the rush of finding that gem. So, yes, you're always scrolling on your platforms, your preferred selling platforms, your preferred auction houses. But walking into a show and going and finding that special piece that you've been wanting for so long that you've never actually seen physically because yes, you've seen it online, but you've never held it, seen it, touched it. <laughs> There's no better feeling. I'm sorry. So thank God there is all of those smaller card shows, medium-sized card shows, and larger card shows because it provokes a, a, a social event that you cannot compare with a virtual access like cell phones and desktops and computers. So for me... It's always going to be something about the feel, the touch, and the hunt. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. There's nothing like walking into a card show and just you know putting your head down and looking through the showcases and uh, scanning for a card that you want to buy or something that's just going to kind of make your eyes pop and whatever it yep. might be. And then of yep. course the the I don't know how, how to say this the ultra convenience of being able to just pay for it and walking away with it. You know, there's no, no Physically risk having it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I do my fair share of buying online, but you know, you always have in the back of your mind that mail day, which is a great thing in and of itself. The mail day is, is almost as fun as, right. as being at a card show, but you always, there's that still that risk of, of the shipping and all this and that that happens. And is it, is it what you wanted and or is it going to be damaged and how did they ship it? Whereas at a card show, you just get to pick it up and walk away with it. I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. Well, see, you just said the word pick up. What I was going to say is the pick. I'm sorry, but the pick that you actually pick something in a showcase or with a dealer. And don't forget, we're all there with a common interest. How great is it to be surrounded with 500 people to 5,000 to 25,000 people with the common interest of sharing a hobby together. Why do you think book clubs exist, wine clubs, uh, stitching clubs? They all have their shows too. <laughs> they all have their network. And sure, you can do it online. You can do it on your own at home. But what better feeling to interact with human beings, especially after a pandemic, that are actually selling or buying something that you actually love and have interest in. The no energy. computer can beat that. No computer no. can beat that. I'm sorry. I, I agree. It, it's the energy of the room. I always ask when after a card show that I'm not at, I always ask people, what was the energy like? Like speak to uh, the feeling, the feeling you had in the room. What was the energy in the room? What was the energy that people were, were kind of uh, uh, expressing about the hobby overall? That's the kind, and then and then the other benefit is that instead of negotiating with somebody through a platform where you can submit an offer and then they can just ignore you or they can, <laughs> or they can give you a counter offer that is insulting. When you're in person, people are a lot. I think they're just a lot friendlier for the most. Not everybody, but no. for the most part, 
they're easier to work with. They, they you know, you're, you're going to think you're going to have fewer sort of altercations in person mm-hmm. versus, uh, you know, the online drama that can come up. And, you know, we see, we see every board heroes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then we see the different excuses that, that people make on, on eBay for not paying for items. I mean, that's not going to happen. If you do a deal at a card show, the deal's done. You got your their money in your pocket and they walk away. And I mean, and the, you know, yep. you, you've, you've got your, you got your new card. So uh, and the good old money. handshake and the good old handshake when the deal is completed. I mean, and, and fostering relationships for future business. You, you in person is way better than any online experience for sure. Uh, I want to exactly. bring up, a, I like this comment here, punt pass click, I think makes a very astute comment says show organizers need to be more like curators. I love that versus just taking any dealer's money to set up. Most shows look exactly the same with with most dealer pushing the same thing. So, I mean, I've heard this comment before. I've talked to show promoters in the past who've told me that, yeah, they want to they do want to curate their show with, you know, I don't know. I don't want to say modern dealers, but because I don't want I don't mean modern cards, but I mean dealers who embrace clean showcases not dusty scratched up glass top or plastic top showcases one of the things that i i will walk right by your booth if i see cards and top loaders with elastics around them it's just (laughs) i i I can i can smell the dust so i mean if you if if that's the way you deal i mean that's fine because it's 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 who you are what you're doing but you're you're kind of your clientele unfortunately are dying off or have died off by now. People want to mm-hmm. see it. You go to a card show. I want a clean, uh, a, basically an aroma-free, dust-free environment where people care about their merchandise and they actually merchandise, meaning display and market their inventory versus have it stacked up in a showcase and just kind of sit there and, and expect people to come by. You also have yep. to engage with people. You have to engage with kids. Very important to engage with kids. So my question based on this little r- mini rant, if you will, based on punt pass clicks comment, which I completely agree with is for you, Andre, in the Montreal show, how how important is it to you to curate your vendors? And number two, what challenges will you have? Because I'm sure there's lots that have been there a long time that are going to tell you to pound sand if you tell them they can't come back. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, at the end of the day, it's a reflection of who we are. So uh, ultimately, we, we were, how can I say this? We choose who we want as dealers. Please don't think that we're, we're taking anyone that we can. We have a set location with X amount of tables. And we're going to think what's the best dealer corporate that are the reflection of the promoters and the owners. And we have a, a lineup of I don't know, 30, 40 dealers right now that wanted to attend the show. It's not necessarily that we didn't want them there. It's just we prefer exposing and sharing quality to the reflection of the show that we're putting together. So if if you're just looking at volume, 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 well, the thing is you're going to expect also to have clients that, that are going to be volume, volume, volume. We want to make it a, it's it's good for everyone. But well, we also want to make it an experience where, hey, it's, it's twice a year, four to five days a year only. Let's up the bar a little because all those smaller dealers, they can set up in your local shop or local weekend shows and no problem. But this is the Montreal show. So we're going to raise the bar a little and make it that we have better corporate, better dealers, better products, better ideas. You know, there's another idea that we'd even talk about. I think I'd even mention it to you. The Sunday is is ladies first. So we came out with a promotion. So ladies first, they get VIP access at nine o'clock on the floor, VIP treatment, which is free entrance, front of the line access. They're getting free packs of hockey cards, as well as a free autograph of Kim St. Pierre and Melody Daou. Wow. So it's about a $150 package that we're giving to every girl, lady, coming into the show on the Sunday. Wow. You know why? Because we we feel that it's some sort of cliche that it's the man that collects and the wife that goes shopping. Hey, 
these girls sometimes feel intimidated and they're, they're awkward. They, they, they want their place in their hobby. And trust me, I know a lot of girls that know as much or maybe more than you and I combined, but they don't want to be bothered. So they prefer buying online. And so, you know what? Ladies first, that's what it's called on this Sunday. Come on, let's go. You are, you are who you are. So come on in. You're more than welcome. I got, I got to give you kudos on that. Listen, I, I think it's really cool. Number one, because we need to, we need the hobby to be diverse, uh, you know, across race, color, creed, religion, and gender. And uh, so I think it's really awesome that you're doing that. And uh, and I hope you get a great turnout from it. There's There are all sorts of, of women movements in the hobby, women in the hobby, women of the hobby. Uh, yeah. I think it's awesome. I was, when I was, when I was just in San Diego last weekend at the show, and I do this all the time, I've said it before, but I see, I see a woman and, and, this this case, it was a woman, not with her husband or boyfriend, but with three boys, younger boys. You know, she was in her whatever, 30s or 40s, and the boys were in their early teens. And I and I looked at the boys, and I said, ah, I see mom dragged you all to the card show, you know, and she laughs, and right, it's kind of funny because that well, wasn't the yeah. case. But it is the case for a lot. There are a lot of women that collect in the hobby. And you know, yeah. you said that it can be awkward for them. I think it can be awkward for them because they know that that I believe a lot of the vendors and other attendees either assume that they don't know what they're doing or assume that they're just there with their husband or boyfriend or they got lost. What are you even doing? You know what I mean? This yeah, is an assumption. Exactly. But yeah. we have to embrace them because, hey, who says cards are just for boys or men? I mean, they're they're awesome. So they should be awesome for every living being. I don't so understand any human that doesn't collect cards. Let's be honest. So yeah, I think that's well, really that, cool, Andre. That, that's, well, that's that was really the cool. last curveball I wanted to throw your way uh, with this uh, wonderful time that I've spent with you by saying the ladies first is our uh, it was our, our kind of a cherry on top on uh, this new wave of change for Montreal. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. I, I look forward to, to witnessing it and seeing how it goes and what the Thank turnout you. is. Okay, let's go through a couple more comments here. Uh, yeah. Contender Sports Cards on Instagram says, is prospecting going to become the future of the card industry? I, I'm just going to handle this, Andre. I'm going to say no. I don't think it's going to become the future of the card industry because there is, you know, right now there's 140 years of body of work of, of cards in the past. So if you're only prospecting, uh, that means we're not collecting Hall of Famers or veterans or current stars. I think that to me, that's almost like saying, you know, is fried chicken the future of fast food or something like that? It, it, it's a portion. It, it's one segment of a much larger, uh, much larger hobby. So I think it's an easy no for that one contender. Uh, Jim says nothing beats the buzz of a good show. If it wasn't for shows, I wouldn't know either of you. We all live in different cities, but met in Edmonton probably. I think we did, Jim. Although I, I, I Jim is somebody whose face I just I've known for probably 20 years by now, but yeah, oh, yeah, nothing beats the buzz of a good show. And now that, now that shows have become, you know, social events on top of just card shows, it's more than just when you're in the show, you know, it's the after, it's the after events and the, and the dinners and the, the networking and all that. Like I mentioned at the beginning of my announcements for this episode, Andre, at Thursday night, November the 10th at the Toronto Expo, as I have done for 12, 10, 10 years now, I'll be hosting the the dinner on at Jack Astor's, you know. So I hope to see you there, Andre. I know you'll be in Toronto, yeah. and anyone else who's listening or or watching this right now, if you'll be at the Toronto Expo Thursday the tenth, reservations for seven thirty. The show ends at eight o'clock that night, so I'll be coming after. But I uh, hope to see everybody at the Jack Astor's, and you know, more information to come on the channel for that. Uh, Punt Pass Clicks says, have any show organizers ever run a revenue split with the dealers versus pay for space? Then you're all in it together. They pay eBay 15% for an audience. Why not 5 to 10% in person? That's a really interesting concept. I've never heard of that model, but um, Andre's nodding as if it's not a bad idea. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. something to maybe think about, right? So take a screenshot on that one. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Clint Kelly says, I've been attending the Anti-Expo for years. I'm looking forward to the upcoming show. I, too, can confirm that language is not a barrier. I'm happy to hear that, and I look forward to meeting you there. If we haven't yet met Clint, it's I'm terrible with Thanks, uh, with matching names to faces, but I hope to see you there, Clint. I'm I'm sure I will. Doctor Mantis Toboggan says a league of her own and Diamond Princess. I guess those are two accounts on Instagram 
worthy of a follow. I believe that's what Dr. Mantis is saying. So thank you very much for that. And I do believe I follow a league of her own already. Uh, Punt Pass Click says, I'm messing, with, I'm messing with tabletop touch screens that display cards and replace physical cases. With all the vaults popping up, you can set up in real life selling your remote inventory. Saves hassle and cost. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad that, yeah, you're messing with it. And let's face it, that might be a way of the future. But with he, he mentions with all the vaults popping up. Listen, my thoughts on vaults are that they definitely serve a purpose in that like five figure and up card category. You know, I understand yeah. keeping cards that are, you don't want to be lost to fire, theft, flood, uh, weather, that kind of thing. But I mean, I don't know. I want I want to have my cards in hand and uh, vaults definitely have their purpose, but uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a card in hand kind of person. How about you, Andre? I'm card in hand too. I'm, uh, I, I'm, you know what? I'm like a little squirrel. I prefer hiding them all over the house <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> than yeah. consigning them with someone than not knowing what, what's going on. Exactly. How's your time? Are you good for a few more minutes here? Or do you got to go? I am good for 15% left on my cell phone right now. Okay. 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 Let's keep going. <laughs> let's keep going. Rage says, uh, talking about prospecting, uh, no way because prospects were huge in the junk wax era as well with, Jeter, A Rod. I mean, Jeter and A Rod are both okay still. Greg Jeffries, not so much. Lindros, Bure, still good, but I, I understand people are still collecting those. Hockey Bar says hockey prospecting, I think, is less a gamble as other major sports. The big two to four names seem to usually always turn out as a good investment. Uh, most of the time, yes, but, but I'm just reminded of Yakupov and Dag and, you know, even, even some others who are. You know, Yashin was a second overall pick, I believe. But listen, we could we could poke holes in anything. Um, but yeah, for the most part, the, one of the other things I want to say about hockey versus, you know, basketball and football specifically is that hockey rookies are often 18 years old. They don't have to go yeah. through college first. Where football and basketball players, for the most part, go through college first and come in as rookies at the age of like 22, 23. I think there's right. more risk in hockey when you're dealing with 18 year olds and there are in basketball and football dealing with 22 year olds. So take that right. for, for what it's worth. Uh, Mitch says, how could they track profit? Most of the deals are cash. Can't imagine most of the dealers I was. And that makes sense, Mitch. My thought, maybe I misunderstood. The question was a revenue split on the gate admission basically, yeah. or, or that yeah. kind or maybe not charging not on sales. sales. Yeah, yeah. That kind of, that was more my thought. And I would, I don't know how that would work. Uh, Sam says, I find one of the challenging things about being a local show promoter is the vendor list. If you don't have enough space, it can be tough to turn down folks. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense to me. Mitch says, you would still have to go buy an honor. Yeah, okay, we're going to skip back because I don't think that was the, the spirit of the question. Hobby Champs, a great Twitter follow, says, vaulting is for people with crazy significant others. <laughs> <laughs> I like him. Yeah, that, <laughs> or her. Uh, that's a reason I didn't mention a few minutes ago, but I got to add that to my answer when I talk about vaults for sure. For sure. Skeppy says, have you guys ever attended a show that provided lockers that they can rent to secure items during the show? I haven't, but is that that might be a good idea. I mean, I'm, that's an outside the box kind of idea. Never thought of it, yeah. but uh, wait, is that wait? I just want to reiterate it. Is that for for dealers or the attendees? I think it's for attendees. So, like you know, maybe although most attendees, you know, they've got their car, they've got whether they have a wheelie suitcase, uh, suitcase, or they've got their their Zion cases, or they've got their backpacks or whatever. I mean, man satchels. Yeah, what a man satchel, women, women and their purses. However, however, yes. us, however, any collector carries along there, carries around their their cards. I mean, that's not um, a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Skeppy was talking about attendees. I think it's an idea. I've never, I've never heard of anyone using it though. But yeah, yeah, maybe, I like the idea. Nice idea. Uh, Rage yeah. says it would stop the theft. I love the idea to use a screen for show purpose and then hand the person the real card uh, at their request for purchase. Yeah, as a as a as an attendee though, guys, I, I don't want to walk around looking at your screen. I'm probably gonna walk right by, at least in 2022, 2023, until until I am really acclimatized to that setting and, and that whole kind of uh model of card shows where I can't look at 
I mean, I may as well stay at home and just look at the look at your 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 eBay store or whatever. Kind of you know? de- kind of defeats the purpose a little, honestly. A little no disrespect. But, not, but I'm gonna be open minded and say maybe that's the direction the hobby will get to yeah. eventually. Course, but I will also, yeah. in the same breath, say I sure hope not because it will right. reduce my enjoyment for sure. Correct. Uh, Hockey King Collectible says vaulting is the offshore account for collectors hiding numbers from the wife. I've recently heard someone say that that you know that yeah that's what they're doing. It's like you vault it because you don't want your wife to start asking questions. So I I have heard that uh, being out there before as well. Punt Pass Click says it's just a showroom for cards, not a new concept in any other retail world. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. So. Um, okay, before we cut out, your 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 battery is dying. We're at the hour twenty mark, and you know this is a this is a like a special night episode of Sports Cards Live because I couldn't do a show last Saturday. I was having fun at the Union Marketplace show in Del Mar, just a, a suburb of, of of San Diego. So trying to get the episodes in, nonetheless, and it it does hurt me that I can't do shows every Saturday anymore because I'm traveling to card shows. Um, so that's this, but this Saturday we will have a show. The next Saturday. Uh, we won't. I will be at Andre's show in Montreal. Saturday after that, we will. This, the next Saturday, I'll be in Toronto. So that's happening quite a bit. Um, Rage, what does Rage say? Of course, I agree. Real card, real card first. Buy definitely a lot better than some of the terrible startup ideas in the past. Hockey King says, what's next? Vending machines for slab cards? Probably. I mean, I can probably, easily, yeah. I can <laughs> see that now, but now it's like, hey, I guess I got to buy the front card so I can get the card behind it, which is not a bad sales tactic. Or trying to reach your hand underneath to try and steal it. <laughs> right. Or someone just sh- shattering the front glass and pulling out, pulling out the inventory, right? Have to be in a well secured area. Skeppy says, if I were a dealer, I would have two or three large monitors behind me with prices. You could change anything on the fly and organize much easier. A quick shout out to uh, Magpie. Magpie is a service. Uh, Catherine Harrison's the founder. I, you know, she's a, become a friend of mine in the hobby, and she's trying to build ways for vendors at card shows to just better, you know, better showcase and and manage their inventory. And maybe that's the kind of thing that she is going uh, going for. So, uh, shout out to her. We're gonna have her on the show here in the next couple months for sure. I want to. I just want to take a quick look at my notes. I have a bunch of things we didn't really talk about yet, but uh, oh, we have to touch on this, Andre. I guess we have actually. It basically the importance of of live in person gatherings. We touched on that throughout this episode. We don't need to go much more into that. Um, final question really is going to be your outlook on the sports card market overall as we move forward out of the pandemic um, into this kind of depressed market. Prices are down from the peaks, but still up from pre pandemic. What's your outlook on the overall sports card market? I think that right now with the stability that we're seeing, it's actually now uh, secured, uh, never guaranteed, of course, but it's actually nice. Uh, I'll talk more for hockey because that's more, more my line of expertise. Hockey was, you know, if, if you look at the common sports in the U S was maybe as, or a little under popular compared to ping pong. So it's nice to see that hockey market went up a little more and quite, quite frankly, even if I do follow other sports and I do concentrate on hockey, I'm happy to see that the, the pandemic kind of brought the value up to now create a stability where you see more and more people investing. You see more and more demands, offers. I feel that the hobby is back where it should be at, where it's, it's an investment, yet it's a pastime, and you can find a happy middle between both. Well said. Well said. I, I, I think, I think it is stable. I think the hobby is, is the hobby is, it's been stable for a long time because we have a foundation of collectors who are always going to collect, mm-hmm. whether they can collect the cards that are going up in value or going down in value. Let's face it, in a down market, it's easier to buy, even though it can be scarier, which is right. kind of counterintuitive, but it is just the human, uh, human kind of psychology. But right. um, you know, I, I've said, I've said a few times recently that hockey collectors are somewhat uh they're firm in their beliefs and they're firm in their passion for the for the just like baseball collectors i think baseball and hockey have the most the, the the strongest foundations of of card collectors really comparing that to uh football and basketball we see a more transient collector there rightfully so because the values have gone 
have gone pretty crazy, especially in basketball. And then, of course, compared to, you know, soccer and F1 and, and wrestling, although wrestling's impressed me. The wrestling collectors, I should say, really impressed me. They, they love what they're doing. I don't see them stopping if, if values come down. Um, F1's, F1's a little bit more, uh, I'd say, up in the air. And then soccer, I think, has more potential than anything. But I, don't oh, know the found, I just don't know that the yeah. foundation is quite as established as it is in hockey and baseball at this time. Okay. Well, Any comment on that? No, no, uh, you're 100% on the same uh, page as what I was thinking. So, yeah, All right. David G is haunted by the Jacques Plante mask that uh, is just above <laughs> your your left shoulder. and But I love your background. It's pretty awesome. Hockey King Thank says you. digital price tags like grocery stores use that you can easily update all at once. Interesting, interesting. And Skeppy says, Jay Lee, have her reach out to me. I have another idea she might have interest in. Uh, who are we talking about? Who's she? Who are we talking about, Skeppy? I can't. Uh, I don't know who we were no talking idea. about there. I forget. Mm. But if you no let idea, me know, but... that'd be great. Okay, so we're we're gonna we're gonna end the show. Uh, Andre's phone is is dying on him. It might be it might be dead right now as he uh, as he fiddles with uh, it. But let everybody know. There you go. Tomorrow, three o'clock Eastern, Collectible Live with C with Collectible CEO Ezra Levine will be joining me. He wants to take questions from the Collectible community. Uh, I think he's got some announcements to discuss or to, to let people know about. That's tomorrow, 3 o'clock Eastern. So kind of off time during the middle of the day, but that's fine. You can always watch it in reruns afterwards. Saturday, Sports Cards Live, 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific with the organizers of the Del Mar Union Marketplace Show. And we're going to bring them on. Let's see what they say that's different from what Andre says because – they do, uh, you know, they, they did a great show last week and they're in a completely different market, kind of kind of the opposite end of North America from Andre. So we'll see what, what they have going on. And uh, I'll, again, I'll be at the Montreal show. Make sure to come see me. I can't wait to meet those of you that I haven't yet. Thank you, Skeppy. Magpie, got it. Now I remember we're talking about Catherine. Appreciate that very much. Justin Vick, enjoyed the hump day edition of the show. Good luck with your event, Andre. Very nice, Justin. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, final comments to you, Andre, and then uh, and then we're done. Well, guys, I really hope to to see you in Montreal. Um, not this weekend, the following weekend. So on the 29th and 30th of October, come see us. Check out the website. Uh, we have a nice announcement uh, on Sunday, the 30th at noon. We're launching the rebrand, the rename, the new name. Uh, we're super excited to present it. In the meantime, come out. Um, if you can't, we'll check out uh, what's going to be happening for the spring show. However, um, for now, I can say that it's a really good show. It's a strong show. Great people, great dealers. Thank you, thank you, thank you in advance for coming out. Come and say hey. Uh, most likely, I'll be with Jeremy and 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 uh, along with some uh, some old friends of the hobby. So, thank you again, Jeremy, for taking the time, um, doing my this pleasure. for us, for me, I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Uh, you're an old friend and you'll always be a friend. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, you bet, Andre. I'm here to, I, I want to support you. I want to support your show. I'm excited to come out to it. And I, I wish you the best, of course. And uh, to the chat, thank you for your engagement. Thank you for showing respect to Andre. I appreciate it. And a uh, couple, we're just going to run through the final comments. Hockey King Collectibles, good to see you out of California. It looks like Big Daddy Cool makes the comment that eBay is now making you send graded cards that exceed a certain threshold to a third party before the sale is complete, in addition to 15% on sale and shipping. Fair comment. Stam, thank you for joining. And Tom Tom Bullard, much love back to you. You stay, I love that. Enjoy cardboard, everybody. Uh, hockey Cards Up says, merci, guys. All right, everybody. Thank you again thank for you. joining. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow on Collectible Live. And we'll see you on Saturday again on Sports.